those who are here for the first time, we, um, we thank you for being here. Let's open with a word of prayer in the name of our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Father, as we gather here tonight, our last evening in our three-night mission, we thank you for the opportunity to share our thoughts and words about journeying through Lent to Easter. May we always be open to learn more about this Lenten liturgical season and accept the many invitations it offers us in order to grow in our faith and love for you and others. We thank you for your unending mercy May we show mercy to others. Thank you most of all for the gift of your Son, who gave his life so that we might live. In Christ our Lord, amen. Now do a reading from Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, in you I trust. Do not let me be disgraced. Do not let my enemies gloat over me. No one is disgraced who waits for you, but only those who are treacherous without cause. Make known to me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me by your fidelity and teach me, for you are God, my Savior. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your compassion and your mercy, O Lord, for they are ages old. Remember no more the sins of my youth, Remember me according to your mercy, because of your goodness, Lord. To you, O Lord, Christ, your Great. 
And we try to offer a quiet moment that will kind of lead us into the retreat itself. And um, a couple of years ago, we did this with a slideshow of all of um, the grounds in Notre Dame Retreat House. And so taking off from that with the uh, gift of Father Steve and his photography and Rose and some of her pictures and um, many of the pictures that people who have blessed us on our property have taken, we've put together a little slideshow um, to kind of bring us in and to quiet our minds and our hearts. And um, oftentimes, especially on our grounds, it's such a prayerful place that the beauty that surrounds us draws us into prayers so often. And I enjoy when there's a day when I look out my window and someone's sitting on a bench facing the lake in prayer. Or when Father Dennis Billy is walking his route up the hill and then down the hill with his rosary beads in prayer. Or remembering Father Paul Miller, who many of the guards you, you will see in our pictures were created by him. And on any given day, he would be kind of leaning on a hoe or leaning on a rake. And you see him in prayer, um, thanking God for the many blessings around us. So, um, we're going to offer this time of quiet, and hopefully it'll bring you into a quiet prayer as we transition into tonight's um, program.
Read that in the speech after the peacefulness of the uh, the music. sharing with you something that has struck me more or less forcefully for the last 30, 35 years. It dawned on me once, I guess I was in a gift shop, and I was looking at, you know, chains of medals, crucifixes and stuff like that. And then I was watching other people buying things. And what struck me was the people who were looking at the crucifixes. And I see people are wearing crucifixes, and I salute you. I think that's a wonderful thing. And I wore one for a very long time, and when I wear my redemptor's hat, there's a crucifix in the redemptor's hat. But what struck me was listening to people 
talk about, oh, this is a really pretty one. Oh, I like that. So that was gold. Oh, she would look so good in this. And I said to myself, how odd that we would take what was in the ancient world the instrument of torture devised to provoke and sustain for days the most hideous and painful death that could be imposed upon a fellow human being. That we would take that turn it into a work of art or a piece of jewelry. I remember trying to imagine people going, oh, did you see that hangman's noose? Oh, really? It's expensive. Where did you get it? And that little electric chair you're wearing in your earring, and it lights up. <laughs> Why don't we do that? <laughs> I remember because uh, at one time I was a senior lifesaver. And uh, watching the guys in their, you know, trunks showing off their physiques and having a cross because it looks sexy. Years of reflecting on them. By the way, I wear crosses also. And I look pretty sexy when I wear them myself. <laughs> uh, I think the answer lies in the fact that the cross always points beyond itself. If that cross was like a roadblock that you could not get beyond. What a different world this would be. Some 30 years before I became the director at uh, Notre Dame Retreat House, one of my confreres who was director there was well ahead of me. And I got together with an artist And they designed a 15th station. So there are 14 stations. And the first is, you know, Jesus is condemned to death, and the 14th is Jesus is laid in the tomb. Well, my predecessor, working with an artist, decided, nah, that's not right. And they actually created a 15th station. And if you come up to the retreat house, you will have the opportunity to see it. It's quite nice. I mean, it fits in with the others. But it is of the resurrection. So we put Christ in the tomb, and on the 15th, Christ is rising up. The cross must point beyond itself to the one. sat here for two nights and I'll into the third night if that's a dead end. The whole point is that's not a dead end. The whole point of the exercise of meditating, of fasting for 40 days is indeed to see that try to understand that, to try to, in faith and trust and love, be part of that, but never to end.
to Job character. I didn't hear it, I read it. In the New York Times, when I was teaching in the seminary, which now puts us back, I think around 1981. And I was reading an article in the New York Times on humor and the various tests that the particular psychologists involved were devising to try and figure out whether or not a person had a good sense of humor or they were sick. And here was one of the little jokes on the test. It seems there was a mountain climber who had decided he was going to try and you know, scale up this high precipice which was extremely difficult, but he was a good mountain climber and wanted to, you know, test his skills. So as he climbed up, he had been almost to the top. When something went wrong, he slipped and fell off. And he's plummeting down to his death below, hundreds of feet onto rocks where he would certainly be smashed. And in desperation, without much thought, his hands are flailing, and by luck, one of them latches onto a little bush growing out of the side of the cliff face. And he clutches it with one hand, he grabs it with the other hand, and he's hanging there, trying to catch his breath. And the little bush starts pulling away from the cliff face. And he knows he's never going to be able to climb back up to the top. So in desperation, he looks up into the heavens and he shouts out, Oh God, help me! And to his surprise, a great voice booms back and says, My son, I have heard you. Let go of the bush. All will be well. The climber thinks about that, looks back up into the heavens and shouts, Is there anybody else out there? <laughs> <laughs> if you laughed, you're helpful. If you didn't, simulate. <laughs> Is there anybody else out there? And many times in our faith and in our life, I think that is what we shout out. Is there anybody else out there? It seems perhaps that God asks too much. I've taken that little joke and I've given it a slightly different ending. The climber hears the voice, releases the branch, and falls to his death. And to all this. mystery of the cross, to be willing to truly identify with my brother, with my Lord. And yet, please go all the way. By going all the way, I mean, you don't end there. There are strains of Christianity that would make our faith groovy. Oh, God. I remember when I was a little boy growing up. I have a French Canadian background on one side. The French Canadians, if there's any of you here, can attest to this. There was a lot of Jansenistic thinking in the French Canadian church. And Jansenism is a heresy in the church that kind of sees sin everywhere. I don't know if any of you grew up that way. Are any Irishmen present here? <laughs> yeah. Where, you know, give that much to that sin. It's such an awful way to live. My 
favorite definition of Puritanism, and Puritanism has certainly seeped into so much of American life in many, many ways. My favorite definition of Puritanism is the irrational fear that someone somewhere may be having fun. But a Christian, with all of that, should be having fun. Because we don't end there. We should be, and are known to be in the world, happy. I was talking to a redemptorist missionary in Japan. He told me that they had received special permission from the Vatican to marry non Catholic Japanese people in the Catholic Church. Because the Japanese look upon our faith as a faith of love and joy. And by being willing to Enter in with them and marry them. It was also the opportunity to evangelize and teach them. But I love the fact that they would look upon us as a religion of love. Christianity did not. take over the Roman world by being the religion of doom and gloom. I mean, why would anyone want that? We are not that at all. We are the people who believe First of our wounds, but then of ourselves. Let me give you a piece of scripture. St. Paul, writing to the Corinthians. And this, by the way, is within, 50, within 20 years of our Lord's death, okay? This is what is being written. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. If all there is is the cross, Proclamation has been in vain, and our faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify of God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is and you are still in your sins, then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. St. Paul, writing within 20 years, Christians did not celebrate the crucifixion. They celebrated the resurrection. They were all too painfully aware of the crucifixion. The ancient Christians didn't wear very pretty crosses. First symbol was the impulse, which is 
Greek word for fish. You'll see, you'll see that, okay? That was one of the earliest symbols of Christ. And the reason why is because in the boss, we take the letters and they become the first letter of this string of Greek words. Jesus Christos Theulios Sotia. There. Aren't you glad to learn Greek? <laughs> Any Greek present? Translation. Jesus Christ, or Jesus the Anointed of God. Son of God, Theulios. Generally, the earliest process did not include the corpus, the body. What, what, why would you betray the magic body of the Savior? And I believe the earliest cross that we have with the corpus is a cross of Yea Big with the corpus of Bob that day. And that was against the wall. You couldn't see it. We move through this, and this is essential. Symbolisms here I've just noticed here in our church. The cross is in front of the tabernacle. But we all know where our Lord Jesus is. And your eye goes beyond the cross to the tabernacle. And I would hope you then turn your head. Doctrine now. The doctrine of the mystical body of Christ. We pass through Lent into Easter. And Easter becomes our reality. And we become the reality of Easter. something else. My brain is not a normal brain. I don't even remember where I saw this. But it looked through sentence. It said, in the eyes of the world, you are just one person. But in the eyes of one person, you may very well be the world. torture. It is because we 
We want with all our heart to be strong. Good yeah. afternoon.
join me in reciting the Lord's Prayer. Does the Lord love
visuals that you shared with us and the gifts of your stories and experiences and wisdom have certainly enriched our journey towards the joy of Easter. And I would like to conclude, if I may, before we go and get all the goodies on the side of the link, I'd like to ask Father Frank and Nancy to come down here because I would like to lead us all in giving them a special blessing in their continued ministry. Yes? So please come down here. Step into my office. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to invite all of you to stand and aim your right hand and arm in their direction as we pray over them. Almighty God and Father, we are so blessed with these past several nights of mission as we renew our commitment to you and our commitment to be telling witnesses of your love for us as we head towards Easter joy once again. And we thank you for sending us, Father Frank and Nancy, to enrich our lives with their word gift of their faith examples. We ask that you bless them on their journey home, grant them a safe and peaceful journey. And we pray that their work and words may continue to benefit and bear great fruit in the months and years to come, and all we say and do through Notre Dame and beyond. And we make this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Once again, how about a round of applause? Now, as the Italians say, manja, manja, manja. Please join us, and thanks again for coming.